All right, so uh, welcome everybody to our Thursday seminar. Today, uh, we are very happy to have with us uh, Matthias Pierre, who has agreed to give uh, the seminar. I remind you that uh, the rules, the usual rules, uh, please stay muted so that there are no parasite uh, sounds uh, on the line. But you can unmute yourself anytime and ask questions. Uh, you can do with the video whatever you want. You can keep it on, you can remove it. Uh, if we see that there is problems with the connection, I may ask you to remove the video, but uh, so far we didn't have problems before. So uh, uh, I remind you also that uh, we are recording the uh, seminar, so it will appear in the YouTube IFT webinars channel, maybe today or tomorrow, and uh, you will be able to see it uh, if you missed it. So. Uh, Thank you very much, Matthias, and uh, over to you. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Well, it's a, it's a pleasure to, to talk today. Um, well, I, I would rather talk in, in person uh, directly, but circumstances are a bit, uh, a bit different. So, well, today I wanted to talk about the, the, this uh, few works that I, uh, I, I wrote the reference on, the, on this first page. And I chose this title, which is a bit vague, I admit, Searching for New Physics Beyond the Standard Models as I wanted to be able to talk about uh, several aspects of my work that I think could be of interest for both communities of particle physicists and uh, cosmologists. So I hope I will be able to, to give enough uh, physical details without getting too much into the, um, let's say, the techni technicality. All right, so I want to talk today about the standard models. So first, let let me just give you like a, a small uh, reminder of what, what are the standard models. So on the very large uh, distances in the universe, we have the standard cosmological model that describes the evolution of the, the matter which is present in the universe. So this theory is based on general relativity, which is a very nice framework. And by just a few assumptions about homogeneity and isotropy of the universe, and a couple of parameters, we are able to explain the formation of the universe from the first moment to uh, what we can observe today, the acceleration of the expansion. So we can successfully explain the cosmic microwave background, Big Bang nucleosynthesis, as well as the formation of large structure, and as I said, the accelerated expansion. So one of the early successes of this standard cosmological model was actually the, um, the observation of the, the expansion of the universe by Edwin Abel in the late 20s. And you see what, it, it's important for the following. On the other extremity of physical distances, we have the standard model of particle physics that describe interaction on very, very small scales. And this theory describes three of the four known fundamental interaction and is based on special relativity, and it, which is a normalizable QFT, which means that we're able to make prediction uh, very accurate prediction as long as we have uh, enough uh, power to compute a successful, um, success, sorry, successive order in perturbation theory. So this, this theory has a slightly more parameters, 18, but uh, it allows to have a proper description of the microscopic interaction while the standard cosmological model is only, let's say, a descriptive uh, picture. As for example, for the cosmological constant of dark matter, we don't have any uh, model yet to explain this, this aspect. Uh, right, so fortunately for us, phenologists, the story is far from being over. And we know for sure that there must be something beyond this standard cosmological and standard model of particle physics. We know that in the standard model, for, for example, uh, we have the so-called hierarchy problem, where we know that the X um, quantum corrections um, if we assume that the cutoff of the, the standard model should be the Planck scale, are excessively large compared to the, the, the typical mass that we see uh, at the Large Hadron Collider. We also have problems such as the vacuum stability at high energy and an obvious missing piece of the standard model, which is neutrino masses. So we also have strong CP problem and uh, we don't have any dark matter candidate in the standard model. So I assume here that dark matter is a particle. There are also shortcomings of the lambda CDM cosmological model. We have no idea why we have as, almost as much cold dark matter as bionic matter. We still don't know what is a cosmological constant, and we still don't know if inflation is still um, a viable and um, scenario. 
Fortunately for us, we have seen uh, over the past few years, few observational uh, ins in favor of new physics, such as the RK and RD flavor anomalies. And also uh, to mention G minus two discrepancy and the Hubble tension. I think it's a bit intriguing that actually the Hubble tension, which is a tension um, based on your observation on the Hubble parameter at the present time, the, the determination of this quantity is actually one of, the, one of the fundamental pillars of the star model cosmological model. And I think that's a bit intriguing that uh, there is a tension associated to the, let's say, the oldest quantity of this model. So as a phenologist, we see all this list and the question uh, we can ask ourselves is where to start? Any suggestion? So in this kind of situation, I like to think about what will the, the founding fathers of modern physics would say. And we can ask Niels Bohr, for instance, what he thinks. And this boss said, until cosmology and particle physics can be brought together, there is no much hope for real progress in cosmology. So actually, I stole this, um, this citation from a talk by a Rocky Cole that I found on some random website. So I don't guarantee the, the origin of the, the statement. But I think the idea, the idea is interesting. The idea is to really see um, features of both particle physics and cosmology and to, to study the interplay. And I would like to focus on this, uh, this particular axis now. And in addition, I would like to focus on a new physics scenario that would address both cosmology particle physics, but also have um, specific signatures that could be observed uh, in the following future. So I decided to divide my talk in two parts. In the first part, I will try to uh, address uh, both the Hubble tension and the G minus two discrepancy of the muon. And the second part, I will talk about the um, possible dark matter candidate beyond the standard model, as well as the small scale controversies. So in each part, I will detail, of course, uh, what are the relevant uh, anomalies. So the first part, I would like to talk about the cosmological feature of a very light uh, leptophilic boson. Sorry. All right, so let me just remind you um, what is the G minus two anomaly. So you remember from your quantum mechanics lecture that we can write a relation between the magnetic moment and the spin of a particle, which is here on, on the top. And we can write this proportionality factor, this G factor, also called Lambe factor. Um, and we can express actually the difference between G and two, because in the direct theory, we predict this quantity G to be precisely two. And since, uh, the late 40s, we know that quantum correction give rise actually to a non-zero value for this A. And this value for the muon has been measured back uh, almost 20 years ago at the uh, Brookhaven laboratory, up to eight or nine decimals, something like this. And we get this result essentially, which is uh, shown also on this plot on the right. So it corresponds essentially to the blue part. And there have been a couple of theoretical predictions for this quantity, and we see that it typically uh, gets something which is slightly off. So it corresponds to around 3.5 to 4 sigma, depending on the specific um, computation. So this quantity is something which is uh, relatively known. For, for the electron, for instance, it's, it's probably one of the most precisely determined quantity in the actually history of science. So this is extremely impressive, maybe tens decimal for the, for the electron. So we, not, we know actually quite well the QED and electroweak uh, contribution to this factor. However, it still rely on uh, adronic quantities that are still uh, a bit less known. So I, I give you a couple of references here if you want to take a look to see, um, to see a bit more about these uh, adronic uncertainties. So there have been many interpretations over the past uh, decade involving supersymmetric particle, new Higgs, and also dark photons. But uh, essentially, the Fermilab, there, there is an experiment right now at Fermilab that should, in principle, reduce the error actually on this uh, determination by a factor of four. So maybe it will tell us, I don't think it will be able to entirely, entirely rule out or confirm the excess, but we should have a hint whether it's something which is rig something or just maybe a fluctuation. And moreover, there should be an experiment at Jet Park that should actually confirm this, uh, this measurement in the near future. So now let me talk about the Hubble tension. So the Hubble tension is a tension about the determination of the Hubble constant, so the expansion, the, the expansion rate of the universe, H naught. And based on the cosmic microwave background, we can extract uh, 
uh, determination of this quantity, which is something like around 67 uh, kilometer per second per megaparsec. And we can also use uh, information about Big Bang nucleo nucleosynthesis, as well as baryon acoustic oscillation to determine this quantity, and we get something which is actually extremely close. On the other hand, we can also use supernovae actually to measure the expansion of the universe. Supernovas are uh, standard candles. And if we can calibrate these standard candles, we can actually derive an estimation of H0. So this is what the group uh, of the SHUES collaboration have done. So they used uh, cepheids to calibrate the supernova and to determine this value of H0. And they find something which is substantially larger than the result of the scene. They get something which is on the order of 74. Uh, you can use actually other methods to calibrate the supernovas, such uh, the measurement which is done in red, which use the tip of the red giant, red giant branch, sorry, and which gives a value which is also slightly larger than the one of the CMB, but still more compatible. And there have been a couple of other ways of measuring this expansion of the universe, including a lens quasar. So you try to measure the time delay between light rays that, that travel different um, ways around a very massive object. And based on, this, on the time difference, you can infer the value of the other constant. And you get also something which is typically larger than the value of the CM. So if you combine all these things together, you get a significant uh, discrepancy. So all the order of four to six sigma, depending on which, which quantity precisely you, you want to combine. So uh, I don't know if it's a discovery of new physics. I don't know if it's a systematic. What I know is that there is something, something that we, we don't get exactly. So this, this is what uh, I want to point, point, out, sorry, point out in the next slide. So le let me just give you a small, um, small idea about uh, what is this tension. So, well, if you actually attended uh, the talk by Sylvia Galli the, earlier this week, you will probably not learn much, but still. <laughs> All right, so uh, a quantity which is very important for the CMB is the typical angular scale. So what, what this, what this uh, Planck experiment that I represented on this uh, extremely artistic cartoon measures actually this angle, which corresponds to the, the typical angle between um, over densities in the baryon uh, photon plasma, which is observed uh, in, the, in this CMB uh, that I represented here. And we can basically write it down as a ratio of two quantities, one which is the sound horizon, Rs, and one which is the angular distance. Rs is an integral, uh, essentially, of uh, the, uh, the Hubble rate and the sound speed, but everything that happened, sorry, everything that happened before the recombination, Z star. So essentially, it's a quantity that is mostly sensitive to uh, early physics, when the Hubble expansion rate was dominated by matter and radiation. And also, from this, you can, from Planck, you can measure actually the value of theta s by looking at the, the, the spacing of the different, different, different peaks. And we can also infer the value of the sound horizon by looking at the different ratio between the peaks and also more uh, well, the, the total shape of the scene. And from this, we can actually infer the, the angular distance, which in this case depends on the, the, the recent history because it's an integral uh, of a redshift from zero to z star. And it's mostly sensitive to uh, late times. So when the upper rate is dominated mostly by the cosmological constant and by um, the matter component. So starting from this um, over densities in the CMB and looking at the expansion, uh, the universe expands. So this over density actually expand and reach today uh, some, some size that we can actually observe in the sky in the form of baryon acoustic oscillation. So this is represented here. And essentially, they represent the same physical angular size. And uh, we are able to see actually these this spherical shells uh, in the direction of the line of sight and also on the perp perpendicular distance. And we are able to infer two quantities that are important. For example, uh, Hubble time uh, Rs at the baryon acoustic oscillation redshift, and also this quantity. So the baryon acoustic oscillation doesn't allow by itself to measure the value of the Hubble constant. However, what we can do is to use, to assume some value, for example, for Rs, and from the measurement of the BIO, we'll get the value of the Hubble expansion rate at this redshift, which is the order two, let's say. And now what we can do is to use actually a set of uncalibrated supernova that will tell us 
uh, how the other rate goes with redshift. So we, we take this set of supernova from redshift zero to redshift one, for instance, and without assuming a specific, specifically a particular cosmology, we can infer from the BIO scale up to the present time, the value of the Hubble constant for a given RS. And this is what is represented on the plot on the left. So you see this green band, which is a combination of BAO and uncalibrated supernovas. And as, as I said, you can only uh, essentially measure the product of H times RS. This is why you get this uh, long uh, line. And if you take the value uh, RS determined from the CMB, which is this small blue uh, region, you get something which is different from the shoes value, which is in orange. This is, this is I think, one of the, um, the clearest picture for me of the Hubble tension is that there is, there is a disagreement. And what is exactly what is important in this plot is that if you want to solve this tension, uh, first, you cannot move too much this value of theta s. So the, the CMB spectrum is extremely well measured. And if you, for example, shift slightly a peak, based on the, the, the very precise resolution of this instrument, essentially your, uh, your theory will not, will not hold. So essentially what you need to do is to play a bit with RS or DA to keep this value of theta s constant. The thing is, as I said, um, if you use BAO and uncalibrated supernova to determine the value of the Hubble constant, you don't need to assume a specific cosmology for the late uh, time history, which, which makes actually solution based on the modification of the late history very hard to accommodate. However, you can always decrease RS and DA and hope to reconcile a bit uh, the Hubble, the Hubble uh, measurement based on the shoes collaboration. So essentially, if you decrease RS, you will get something which is more consistent. So this is, uh, well, this is um, what you've probably observed uh, in the past few weeks. There are, there are many papers trying to, to actually find a new way of solving this tension. There have been a couple of proposals, such as uh, introducing new neutrino interactions. However, a more detailed study have shown that if you want to take into account uh, gauge invariance and build a, a more, um, let's say, motivated and non-effective uh, non model, it's, it's actually a bit, a bit difficult. There have been other solutions, such as early dark energy, decaying dark matter, and also interacting dark matter with dark energy. So essentially, you, you, need, you need to transfer uh, a bit of your um, different energy quantities in the universe. You need, you need to find a way to transfer it appropriately. And the, the, sorry, this, the kind of solution that we'll focus on today is the extra radiation uh, solution. The main idea is that if you had radiation essentially in your universe before CMB, you will tend, so I am showing the slides before again, you will tend to, to increase the Hubble rate, which depends on the quantity of radiation, and decrease RS. And then you can decrease the A by increasing uh, A0, and you get something which is more consistent uh, with the CMB. So this is, this is kind of this, this partial degeneracy that you can see here. So you can see that you can in increase the radiation and effective, a bit and get uh, a zero, which is slightly, um, slightly more in agreement. However, you, you cannot uh, uh, solve entirely this tension, and actually, uh, it's very hard from the particle physics point of view to actually find something that solves the tension. I don't even know if there is something that is uh, some paper that actually does it, but you can significantly alleviate the tension up to around uh, two sigma level. Uh, one, also, one, one important point is that if, if you look at, sorry, the, the previous slides, so you can see that there are two different contours corresponding to solid line and uh, dotted dashed lines. And they are, bo they are both actually um, determination based on the CMB, but one set assume only high multiple and the other one uh, low multiple. And you see that there is actually a small, um, small tension inside, uh, inside the, the Hubble, uh, sorry, the, the Planck data. And typically, the, the lower multiple will be, will, be, will be okay of having a Hubble which is slightly larger than the CMB, than the typical uh, 70, uh, sorry, 67. The high multiples uh, tends to prefer something which is smaller. So there, there is a small tension here that, that, that it's, it, it, it's interesting to, to keep in mind. Uh, so as I told you before, uh, with BL only, you cannot actually extract the value uh, of the uh, Hubble constant at the present time. But if you combine it 
with uh, information from BBN, because we know that BBN is extremely sensitive to the expansion rate of the universe in the early times, uh, you are able actually to see if uh, this solution based on N effective can alleviate the tension. And actually it tells you that uh, the combination of BBO and BBN makes the solution based on N effective uh, quite difficult actually to, to work. It, it only uh, allows to slightly reduce the tension. So we keep in mind essentially that having the N effective of the order of 0 0.2, 0 0.5 is enough to alleviate the tension, but you also keep in mind that uh, it might uh, be slightly in conflict with BAO and BBN constraint. So we keep that for the, for the rest. So I, I talk about the 10 effective as a way of parameterizing dark, dark radiation. L let me tell you a bit more about this 10 effective. And to do so, I would like to talk about the neutrino decoupling in the standard model. So it will be important for the following. So uh, the, the neutrino decoupling in the standard model will essentially occur when the typical neutrino interaction rate with the other species of the standard model will uh, become smaller than the uh, Hubble expansion rate of the inverse. So this interaction rate can be parameterized in terms of the Fermi constant here that you can see. And if you do a back of the envelope computation, you see that the typical decoupling uh, temperature of the neutrino should be on the order of the milli scale, which means that below this uh, one milli scale, the neutrinos are no longer keep thermalized with the rest of the standard model particle and they just start to, to evolve freely in the universe. Around this scale, there are only three species left in the standard model, electrons, photons, and neutrinos. So what's going to happen is that around one MeV, the neutrino will decouple from electrons and photons. And slightly after, the electron will become non-relativistic, start to annihilate to photons, reheat the photons compared to the neutrino. This is what you see here in green. And at the end, we end up with the photon temperature being slightly bigger than the neutrino temperature. So be careful here. I'm talking about neutrino temperature, but as I told you, there are decoupled species. That means that they are not thermalized anymore. So this temperature is just a way, if you want, of parameterizing the, the energy density of the neutrino, but it's not really a temperature. So by definition, actually, we will call the, the quantity of radiation in the universe. We will define it in this way. Uh, as a function of the radiation energy density of the universe. And if we plug this value, this radiation corresponding to the neutrino, we get something which is, uh, which should be uh, around two. So it turns out that in the standard model, even though we have three neutrinos, we get something which is slightly bigger, 3.0.45. So why we don't get exactly three? Because this definition uh, is supposed to match precisely three when we take an instantaneous decoupling um, approximation. And also, I said that the decoupling temperature was 1 MeV, but in practice, it's not something, as I said, instantaneous. You need to take into account uh, the fact that it actually lasts a bit. And there are also some effects such as neutrinos oscillation and QED finite temperature correction that gives uh, slightly difference. So uh, for the following, we keep in mind that we find the N effective as being the difference between N effective and what we expect from the standard model, which is something uh, around, around the 3. Uh, so yeah, so I wanted also to show you this, this slide. I think it's important to show you what, what, what is the forecast, what do we expect for the Hubble tension in the future. So in blue here, you see the, the, difference, the different measurements based on, the, for example, supernova, the Schuss collaboration. And in red, you can see the one coming from CN. And in green here, with this uh, huge error bar, you can see actually the determination of the Hubble constant coming from uh, gravitational waves. With one event of gravitational waves, we are able to actually to estimate the value of the Hubble constant, and it precisely go between the two, um, two other measurements. Even though the error bar are super huge, what is important is essentially the, the future. Typically, Gaia delta should help us to increase again the, the determination on the Hubble constant, and also the next mission of uh, CMB. And what is, I think, very important is that uh, accumulating essentially data based on gravitational waves will help, will help us to determine also an, a new independent measurement of the Hubble constant, which uh, does not depend on calibration, which is very important in order to, to cross-check essentially the, the various measurements. And uh, also the Simons Observatory and maybe the next uh, stage four CMP experiment will be able to deliver precision on the determination of N effective or the order of 0.03 which will be able to tell us if the solution based on uh, the solution of the Hubble tension based on the 10 effective is something or not.
All right, I think I said enough uh, for the hypertension. So as I said uh, before, I remind you what I wanted to do with that. I wanted to see if it's possible to unify uh, an explanation for G minus two of the muon and the other tension. So the idea is that we want to introduce a light leptophilic uh, mediator that will actually couple to neutrinos. And by coupling to neutrinos, it will slightly play with the neutrino decoupling, resulting in a temperature of the neutrino bigger than what we expect from the standard model, generating the tenf positive and uh, addressing, trying to alleviate the other tension. And the same mediator could be used to create a contribution to the moment, uh, the, the muon magnetic moment, sorry, in order to have a simultaneous explanation. So uh, the, um, the model we wanted to consider in this case, sorry, is based on the symmetry group L mu, L mu, mu minus delta. So in the standard model, there is a global symmetry where this uh, L mu minus delta is respected, L mu is a muon uh, leptonic number, tau, uh, L tau, the tau leptonic number. It is a summer symmetry which is global, which is already present in a star model. But what is actually intriguing about this symmetry is that you can actually promote it to a local gauge symmetry. And you don't need to introduce any uh, additional fermion because this theory is anomaly free by construction already. So just by itself, actually, I think it's a very interesting exercise to, to, to ask the question, is this symmetry a local gauge symmetry? And if you ask yourself this question, you can write down this following Lagrangian. So you z, z prime uh, the boson associated to this new gauge group will interact with muon tau and the corresponding neutrinos. Now, if you assume that this symmetry is broken at some point, uh, uz prime become massive, and you end up with a very simple model where you have essentially the gauge coupling and the mass of the z prime. So we'll focus essentially on all the possible ranges for the, the gauge coupling, and we'll take a z prime mass, which should be around the neutrino decoupling, in order to affect it a bit. So it will be between, let's say, the muon mass and the CMB scale, one, one e. So in this model, it's very straightforward to compute the contribution uh, G minus two of the muon. You can, you can see this expression and you get something with the appropriate um, contribution for gauge coupling or the order of uh, 10 minus one. Uh, just to tell you a bit more about the model, essentially, sorry, you get, um, Z prime, which is essentially neutrinophilic because it's quite light and it mostly coupled with neutrinos. However, in this model, uh, you can actually add a term in the Lagrangian, which is gauge invariant, the so-called kinetic mixing that you can write between the field strength tensor of the hypercharge and the Z prime. And you can play this game of diagonalizing the kinetic and mass term, and you end up with a Z prime that couples to the current associated to your symmetry plus a small coupling to the electromagnetic current of the standard model. And this small factor is the factor that you add in the, in the Lagrangian field. Uh, so this factor could be essentially anything as it's a, it's a free parameter of the theory. However, in our case, we have actually uh, one, one loop correction, one loop contribution to this parameter given by the muon and the tau. And if we essentially assume that the tree level value for this epsilon is zero, we still get this loop value which we can estimate in our model to be something like the gauge coupling divided by 70. So essentially it tells us that in addition to a coupling to muons and taus, or the prime will also couple to electrons. And typically we'll have a small um, branching fraction of all the prime into electrons. It's important for the following. So the good thing is we only have two parameters in this model. So that's very, very convenient to represent on the plane. So on the y axis here, I have the gauge coupling and on the x-axis, I have here the z-prime mass. So there are essentially three important regions here where we could actually affect uh, the effective number of relativistic species. There is this part in blue, essentially where the gauge coupling is very large, interaction between the z-prime and the rest of the standard model particles are essentially large, which means that the z-prime will thermalize. And this can be ensured as long as uh, the upper expansion rate of the universe at a temperature of the order of the mass of the muon is larger than this rate, annihilation of the muons producing Z prime gamma. Which means essentially if I'm in this blue area, when the muons become non-relativistic, they're able to decay, producing a substantial population of Z prime that thermalizes. So everything above this line will be thermalized before the notion of the couple. So now there are actually two important regions. So if you go below this line, essentially 
the Z-prime doesn't interact enough with the standard model to actually thermalize before the notion of decoupling. But what you could have is a thermalization after the notion of decoupling. So in this case, a Z prime population will be produced by inverse decay of the neutrinos here. And they will, they will reach some thermal equilibrium with the neutrinos after the notion of decoupling. And if you lower again the gauge coupling, um, the, the neutrinos will still be able to produce some population of the Z prime, but not enough to thermalize. So this is the three important regime that I'm going to detail in, in the following. So if we focus first on the thermal regime, which is the simplest one, since the Z prime is in thermal equilibrium with the neutrino and the rest of the standard model, essentially we can, uh, we have an equality between the, the Z prime temperature and the neutrino temperature. And we also know that neutrino oscillations are active, uh, essentially slightly before the decoupling, which means that we can consider that there is only one temperature for the three species of neutrinos. So if we want to understand how the, the neutrino, neutrino decoupling goes in, in this case, we can solve this set of equations. We keep track of the neutrino temperature on one side and the photon temperature on the other side. And compared to the standard model, we actually have uh, two terms that will be important to, to, to include here. So essentially, electron annihilation to neutrinos. As I said, all the prime couple a bit with electron because of the kinetic mixing and to the neutrino because of the gauge coupling. So essentially, we need to, to compute what is the, the typical energy deposit um, from the Z prime in the neutrino sector, but also in the electron photon sector by computing this uh, thermal average rates corresponding to these two processes here. So we can run this, this whole machinery and we actually get uh, this plot. So what I show you on the y-axis is the neutrino, uh, sorry, the photon temperature divided by the neutrino temperature as a function of a decreasing photon temperature. So essentially the time goes on the right. So here I fix a gauge coupling on the order of 10 minus four, which is more or less the value that we need to take to expand G minus two. And you see that if we forget about the, the Z prime for a second in the black dashed line, we actually recover this um, standard model value of the N effective, 3.0.4, corresponding to a photon temperature around 1.4 times the neutrino temperature. Now, if we add the Z prime and we make it actually light, close to a MeV scale, for example, in red, we see that we are able to delay the neutrino decoupling, resulting in a slightly increase of the neutrino density compared to the photons. So we will generate uh, a bit unreasonable in this case, but large uh, data and effective. But there is a part where essentially you generate something which is reasonable. So essentially this gives this plot. So we have the gauge coping on the y-axis and mass of the z-prime on the x-axis. And in this red part, we are able to explain the g minus two. And this blue part, we're able to generate the data and effective between 0.2 and 0.5 that could be able to uh, alleviate the Hubble tension. So you see that we are cornered by the Borexino experiment and this uh, CCFR that are very close to, to attack or surviving parameter space, but the model is still viable and we are able to explain both things with only two parameters, which is not, uh, not obvious. But as I said before, we keep in mind that BBN and BAO doesn't allow for a significant reduction of this tension because in this case, we will generate delta N effective, which will be also present during uh, BDN. However, so now if we go to the case where the gauge coping is very small, actually, as I said, we only have one process to take into account. Production of the Z prime from inverse neutrino decay, and eventually when the Z prime becomes non-relativistic, it will decay back to neutrinos. So in this case, this process uh, could be uh, actually non-thermal, essentially, because the, the neutrinos are not thermalized anymore after neutrino decoupling. So essentially, we need to keep track of the full information of the phase space of both the neutrinos and the Z prime. This is what you get on the left-hand side. So the time evolution and the momentum uh, dependency of this phase space distribution, and on the right-hand side, you get essentially how each sector will tend to transfer energy uh, from one to another. So we can solve this, this, this set of equations. It's not super nice to do, but we can do it. And what we get is the following. So, so if I assume, so I'm still in the weakly coupled regime, so the gauge coupling is small, but large enough, so the Z prime thermalizes with neutrino. This is what you can see in blue here, where I represented the, the, the co-moving energy density of both the neutrino here and the Z prime in dashed line. And as the universe expands, this, this co-moving energy density keeps constant because neutrinos and Z prime are thermalized. At some point, the Z prime become non-relativistic, decays to neutrino, 
and the results in an increase of the tan effective. Now, if you lower a bit more the gauge coupling, you are not able to thermalize the C prime with the neutrino, but you are still able to produce a small population of, of Z prime in the red, in the dashed line. And when the Z prime becomes non-relativistic, it decays back to neutrino and generate the same value for the tan effective. So what is important here is that at the end you get the, the precise value, the same value for the tan effective, even though in one case the Z prime is thermalized and the other one it's not. So what you get uh, at the end of the day is this following big plot. So gauge coupling on the y-axis, mass of the Z prime on the x-axis. So this is the region that I mentioned about G minus two that we already saw. And now the, the region that we get for the low gauge coupling is this huge, huge blue triangle corresponding to the tan effective between uh, 0.2 and 0.5. So you see that there are many constraints coming from stellar cooling, for instance, but we still have an extremely large part of the parameter space which allows to generate a data effective bigger than 0.2. And what is extremely interesting in, my, interesting in my opinion here is that this scenario could allow to alleviate the Hubble tension. Okay, but I mean, if you don't, if you don't believe me, or if you uh, if you don't like um, at all the model, you will be able to tell me in a few years because of the new CMB uh, stage four experiment that all this region above on the left of this dotted line should be completely excluded. So which, which will allow us to exclude more than 10, or 10 order of magnitude of the gauge coupling and six order of magnitude for the C primes. So just for this, I think this is um, an interesting picture and good information that uh, uh, it will be impossible essentially to reach uh, from a particle physics experiment point of view, I think. So that, that's, uh, that's already by itself a good result. All right. So I finished the first part of my talk. So I talk about G minus two. I have a question. Yes, Matthias. Sure. Hello. Concerning the model, um, probably you already mentioned, but uh, so the the what are the, the charges of the leptons with respect to the set prime? Right. So the, the charges are actually fixed. So essentially, n u minus l tau means you have a charge one for the muon and uh, minus one for the for the tau. So, so and cancel anomalies and everything is correct, no? Yeah, yeah. So this is one of the very few extensions of the standard model. Actually, you can you can promote to actually local gauge symmetry without adding anything. There are also alternatives like Le minus L mu or Le minus L tau that works also, but there are very few of them. Okay, thank you. Sorry, shall we ask the questions for this part now, or shall we wait till the end? I don't know how distinct your two parts are. Well, uh, if you want to ask something, you go ahead. <laughs> okay, well, this is Sven. Um, <clears throat> two questions. First, um, this uh, U tau mu that you were mentioning, yeah, that is present and that you gauge, et cetera, et cetera. I remember that this was also often used or employed by uh, people who looked at these flavor anomalies. Uh, yeah. Did you try to make this connection as well, or do you know whether there are prospects for your model, or I don't know? So it, it's actually, I think, uh, essentially working for maybe some of the flavor anomalies, but essentially it concerns uh, higher masses. You, you, I think you can, mm -hmm. um, you can solve these anomalies if you consider a uh, mediator or the order of maybe TV scale. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you, you also need to find a way to couple your medi mediator with the quarks, because... Uh, for example, for the RK anomaly, you need the coupling uh, to oh, well, be... This is just another part that you have to write down, yeah? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. You already want you, the leptonic part you have, and uh, the, the quark part is missing. But... Actually, well, actually this, is, this is what we had in mind when, when we thought about this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. As well. Very good. Very good. And uh, you are mentioning also, we are mentioning the experimental constraints that corner your preferred parameter space. And what are the prospects, for example, for the Borexino or Borexino type experiments? How will this progress? Uh, Borexino, I don't know, actually. I don't know what are the, the prospects, but that's a, that's a very good question. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, I mean, the, the Fermi Lab experiment for G-2 is supposed to release the, the results. I think it was supposed to release them in 2019. So, mm -hmm. essentially, as long as they, they release the result, maybe we will know already. If, uh, if yes, well, okay. <laughs> But I don't know about Boris, no, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Any more questions?
All right. So already 40 minutes, so I will try to be slightly uh, slightly faster on the second part. So in the second part, I wanted to, to make the connection between the so-called uh, small-scale controversies and the possibility of having a dark matter candidate in an extension of the standard model. So in order to do so, let me just remind you the typical um, result mechanism in the context of the WIM record. I'm sure that you, you've seen it uh, quite a bit, but I just want to, to, to show it to you very briefly. So if we have a dark matter particle uh, that is weakly coupled with the standard model and that actually thermalized at some point in the early universe, uh, we can write down the evolution of the dark matter density uh, by writing down this Boltzmann equation, while on the left hand side we have the time evolution of this number density. On the right hand side we have this parameter sigma v, which is the dark matter annihilation cross-section into a standard model fermions. And essentially, at the, at the beginning, when the dark matter is thermalized in this first part of the plot, uh, which shows the co-moving number density as a function of time, essentially. So the dark matter density will follow this uh, dotted line, which corresponds to its, to its equilibrium uh, expected value. So following this line and following the expansion, the dark matter becomes non-relativistic. And at some point, uh, when the temperature drops below 20 times the mass of the dark matter, the upper rate of the expansion becomes too large and the dark matter particles uh, become decoupled. And based on this value of the annihilation cross-section, we get at the end a different value for the density. And what's in interesting here is that we can get the correct rate density if we take this value of the cross-section or the order of this 10 minus 26 centimeter cube per second, which is actually the typical value that we expect for weak interaction, which is quite why it's called the WIMP, uh, weakly interacting massive particle miracle. What is important here essentially is that there are actually two main assumptions in this case. First, we assume that there is a thermal equilibrium between dark matter and standard model in the early universe. And second, we assume that uh, dark matter will mostly annihilate to standard model particles. Now, if we look at the picture, essentially uh, the dark matter picture today, where we show actually the dark matter nucleon cross section as a function of the mass the various constraints that uh, experimentalists gave us over the past uh, few years that are extremely impressive, actually. I think uh, right now they exclude a 10 minus 47 centimeters square for the cross section for 50 GeV mass for the dark matter, which is extremely impressive, actually. Well, we still haven't found anything. So the question is, uh, is it still really a miracle? And I think it's, it's still the case. However, we need to relax maybe some assumptions. So I think it's important, for example, to explore the case where the dark matter is thermalized with the standard model particles. But in this case, we can ask the question whether annihilation to standard model particles is actually not dominant. So dark matter particles could be thermalized with standard model particles, but annihilate to something else. And if you assume that, you are going to write down your new Boltzmann equation. So you have your usual term on the right, the one that uh, appeared before on the slide. So annihilation of dark matter particle to standard model particle. But there will be other terms, such as, such as this one, which correspond to a cannibalization of the dark matter particle. So three dark matter particles going to two. And if we assume that this term in the red is actually dominant over the blue one, we can write down the rate density that we observe today as a function of this uh, strange uh, sigma v, which is a cross-section, um, generalization of cross-section for this three going to two process. And essentially, we can recover the good rate density if we take a dark matter mass typically sub-GV with a gauge coupling relatively large, or the order of one. This is why it's called the strongly interactive massive particle, because it involves typically QCD-like parameters. So uh, one thing which is important here is that we assume that thermal equilibrium was uh, maintained between dark matter and standard model particles. And actually, kinetic equilibrium must be kept until the freeze out of the dark matter particles. Because each process like this, three particles of dark matter going to two, when they are non-relativistic, essentially, it eats a lot the dark matter because you convert one mass of dark matter to pure kinetic energy on the right. So essentially, you tend to heat too much the dark matter particles. And if you don't maintain kinetic equilibrium with standard other particles, you could affect structure formation and get something which doesn't look like what we actually observe in the universe. So I'm not saying that it's impossible. I'm saying that uh, you need to do a specific analysis in this case. So this has been done, for example, in these two references that I give uh, here. So what thing it, uh, one thing important about this mechanism is that it typically involves large coupling and typically smaller masses. 
which tends to uh, produce uh, sizable self-interaction cross-section for the time, which is important um, in the context of the small-scale uh, controversies, which I'm presenting now. So essentially, this, con this controversy is a set of uh, essentially disagreement between embody simulation and what we actually observe on galactic scales in the universe. So initially, there was this, the so-called missing satellite problem. Essentially, we were counting uh, too few satellites, for example, in the Milky Way compared to what we, predict, what we were predicting from embody simulation. But it seems that this problem is actually not a problem anymore. So people have uh, discovered new satellites and find a way to estimate better what, what is the typical number that we would expect. However, there is still the problem that simulation based on pure core dark matter predict uh, dark matter profiles in uh, galactic structure that are very cuspy. And what we observe is something which is slightly more cold. And um, for example, um, Yes, so sorry. So some of the satellites, for example, in galactic structure tend to exhibit an inner mass deficit. So uh, as I represented here on these four plots, we show essentially the rotation curve. So the, the, the velocity as function of the, the radius for the center, uh, sorry, around the center of uh, substructures. And you see that the data points are typically smaller than, smaller, sorry, lower than the, 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 the prediction and what we can see with the simulation. And essentially, this will mean that maybe there is a missing mass problem, essentially, in the center of this survey box. But moreover, it's not, it's not only an inner mass deficit, actually. It's mostly a problem of diversity, because if you look at, for example, this example in green, you get something which is actually substantially above the simulation. So the problem is to explain all these features at the same time. And one other problem is the too big to fail problem. So the simulation tend to predict uh, around 10 subhalos that are actually quite massive. And such, such halos actually do not match the most massive subhalos that we observe in the Milky Way, which means that if they are here and they are purely dark matter dominated, we don't understand why they are not actually forming stars. And this has been observed also in Andromeda and the uh, local group. So this is a set of problems essentially that was, uh, that have been raised uh, since, sorry, since uh, maybe a few years ago, a few years, maybe a decade. And there are uh, potential solutions that have been studying now for quite some time, which is to introduce a small self-interaction for the dark matter. Typically, if you take a self-interacting dark matter, uh, sorry, divided by the mass on the order of one centimeter square per gram, you tend, since the dark matter self-interact, you tend to smooth out any overdensity that you, you might see uh, for the dark matter. So this is what, I, what is represented on, in this plot, essentially. The black line shows the result you get, uh, sorry, from the simulation if you assume uh, such a value, sorry, for the cross-section. And if you don't, if you just assume pure cold dark matter, you get something which is green, which is much cuspier. So this, this would be potentially a solution to these um, small scale controversies. However, so recent work have, have shown that the, the role of variants uh, inside the, the big structure could actually also um, tend to give more information about how, how dark matter behaves in, in this central region. In particular, uh, this plot shows the interplay between the self-interacting dark matter and the bionic component that you can see in red. So if you assume only cold dark matter, you get the, the shape in green. If you assume only self-interacting dark matter, you get uh, this shape in black. But if you take um, self-interacting dark matter and you, you, you add some bionic feedback, you get something which could be essentially roughly in the middle, in the sense that um, the complexity of taking into account baryons plus self-interacting dark matter could be, uh, could be something um, that would help actually with the diversity of the profiles. In the sense that, uh, sorry, you get something which could be flat for the profile, but you get something which would be slightly cuspier as well. So, uh, so as I said, so this, this value of the cross-section could be a help, actually, to these small-scale controversies. But there have been actually a set of constraints that have been deriving, uh, people have derived on this self-interaction cross-section. Typically, um, they've been looking at, for example, cluster collision of galaxies. And by looking at the position of stars after a collision and the position, uh, uh, sorry, of the dark matter halo with the gravitational potential, you actually get 
constraint on the self-interaction cross-section for the dark matter. And you could get something on the order of one centimeter square per gram or even uh, slightly uh, stronger, depending on the specific galaxy cluster. Um, and recently, people have been studying the possibility of um, this self-interaction cross-section to, um, to have a different effect on smaller structures than on bigger structures. Typically, uh, this green dot here will represent the value of the, the, the self-interaction cross-section that you will need uh, in typical galaxy clusters, where the typical velocity in this uh, substructure is large, and this color point corresponds to uh, smaller uh, smaller structures, such as galaxy. So it, it tends to favor um, maybe a velocity-dependent cross-section. So well, from this plot, it's actually not super obvious that um, essentially the, the cross-section need to decrease. However, for the rest of the following, we'll keep in mind that taking this, this value of 0 0.1 to 10 could actually help to solve this uh, small-scale controversies. So I'm running a bit out of time, so let me try to go to go to the point, essentially. We wanted to see if we could provide a self-interacting uh, dark matter candidate in the context of extended gauge uh, theory. So in order to do this, we'll introduce a new gauge group, SU2 cross U1, and we will assume that both these groups will be independently broken by scalars. Um, we'll get actually from these three dark matter candidates, which will be the three gauge field associated to this uh, new SU2 gauge group. And, sorry, uh, we'll be able to connect our dark matter candidate, this, this particle X with the standard model, by um, mixing between uh, this new doublet that we introduced to, to break the symmetry with the standard model X. So essentially, we have two parameters to take into account here, the mixing between the scalars, sine theta, and the gauge coupling. We also wanted to introduce an, another way of connecting the dark matter with the standard model. So we introduce, we introduce a kinetic mixing term between the gauge boson associated to this uh, new U prime gauge group and the hypercharge. So this is the same term that I considered for the, the other model, which is also perf perf perfectly fine to write uh, at the tree level. And in addition, we'll introduce this uh, so-called chan simons term between the Z prime and the dark matter candidates in order to generate essentially this uh, possibility to connect dark matter with the standard model. So with this chan simons coupling and the kinetic mixing. So we have two ways of connecting the dark matter with the standard model particle. But one thing also which is important here is that because of the gauge construction, the dark matter is actually stable and you don't need to introduce any, uh, any symmetry essentially by hand to, to, uh, to stabilize it. It's automatically stabilized by a custodial SU2 symmetry. So, uh, so in this case, as I said, we can, we can actually compute the ray density based on this uh, SIM mechanism by computing a uh, diagram like this. And we can evaluate also the cross-section, the self-interaction cross-section by evaluating this uh, very simple diagram. And so we can represent it as function of, uh, in, in a plot, or represent the gauge coupling as function of the dark matter mass. And you see this red part corresponding to the gauge coupling, uh, the, sorry, the ray density, and this dashed line corresponding to the self-interaction cross-section. And you see that we can get something between 0.1 and 10, However, we need an uh, unreasonably large uh, value for the gauge coupling, just to keep in mind for the rest. However, in our case, as I said, we also have a dark Higgs boson, the particle that actually breaks the SU2 symmetry, which is present in the theory. And even though the mass of this particle could be larger than the mass of the dark matter, annihilation of dark matter to dark Higgs, as I represented on this diagram, could still be possible. Because, uh, essentially, because when the dark matter particles become non-relativistic, if you look at the typical velocity distribution for the dark matter, there might be the tail of the distribution, essentially why you have enough kinetic energy to produce the dark X, which is why it's called forbidden channel, essentially, because if the dark matter particle velocity is zero, since the mass of the dark matter is smaller than the mass of the dark X, you cannot produce it. However, the tail of the distribution allows you to do it. So in our case, actually, we can uh, look at the effect of both taking into taking into account, sorry, this effect and also the SIM regime. And if we look at the contribution of the two of them together, so we have the ray density on the y-axis as function of the, the mass splitting essentially between 
the dark Higgs and the dark matter particles, we get the following plot. We get a part where this uh, mass splitting is smaller than 0.5, where the rig density depends a lot on the mass splitting. It means that uh, if the mass of the dark Higgs is essentially too close to the dark matter mass, you tend to, to have this process which is extremely efficient to deplete the dark matter particles and you get a rig density which is relatively suppressed. If you get a relative, uh, density which is suppressed, it means that you could have a, a, a smaller gauge coupling to achieve the good rig density, which essentially means that your self-interaction cross-section will be completely suppressed. This is what I, what I essentially uh, wrote here. However, if you increase this value of delta, you get, you get to this plateau here, where essentially this process is no longer efficient because the, the mass of the dark heaps is too large, and the SIMP regime so via this three going to two annihilation process will become dominant. So we have a, a resonance effect here, but otherwise the curve is essentially flat and doesn't depend on the mass of the mix. But on this case, uh, this process is much less efficient than this one, meaning that you need a large gauge coupling to achieve the correct rate density, and you could have also, uh, in addition, large self-interaction. So this is something that, so the forbidden channels is something that we particularly don't want, but this is something that we have, so we have to, to deal with it, essentially. And uh, as I said before, something which is important is to make sure that the dark matter keep thermalizing with the um, standard model particles until the freeze out. Otherwise, uh, annihilation via three going to two processes might heat up too much dark matter. So we want to make sure that energy injected during this three to two process is compensated by the typical energy which is exchanged between the dark matter particles and the standard model particles. To do so, we can write down this, this typical energy uh, transfer per unit of time as a function of this expression, which looks a bit ugly, I admit, but I just wanted to show you wh wh what it is. Essentially, it's a, a thermal average of the typical cross-section time, the momentum exchange between uh, standard model and uh, dark matter particles. So what we get in our two different portal is the following plot. We have the coupling on the y-axis between the dark matter particles and the standard model particles as a function of the mass of the mediator. And all these parts in colors are essentially ruled out by either experiments in blue or green, or they don't satisfy the kinetic equilibrium condition because essentially the coupling is too small. So in the case where the, the, the coupling is made via this uh, chan simons coupling here, we only have this small corner of parameter space which is available. And in the X portal case, the relevant coupling is the mixing between the dark Higgs and the standard model Higgs. We essentially get also this small one. But in this case, so if you look at the value of the dark matter mass here, 300 mV, it means that the mass of the dark Higgs must be slightly above. And this is precisely the region where the forbidden regime actually was uh, the dominant one. Meaning that in this case, on the right, we will not be able to have a large self-interaction cross-section. So what we wanted to do actually uh, in the follow-up work is to improve the version of the previous model and to try to uh, come up with something which is uh, slightly nicer, essentially. So in the previous version, we have these three dark matter candidates here. So the three gauge field associated with SU2 that were broken by a doublet. And now what we want to consider is to change the representation of the, of the doublet under uh, the SU2 um, gauge group, so to, to write something which is more general. So we, we will write down its uh, representation 2i plus 1. And if you take higher order representation, what you are going to do is actually you are creating a mass splitting between the third component uh, of your SU2 gauge field and the two first. In this case, this, uh, the dark matter candidate will become the smaller, the, sorry, the lighter candidate, which is X1 and X2, and the X3 will slightly mix with the Z prime boson. And what's important is that we can write the mass splitting between this third component and the dark matter candidate, delta, directly as a function of the representation of the scale. So it will be important for the following. So in this case, our dark matter is still stable because it's stabilized by remnant uh, Z2 symmetry, remnant of the, of the gauge symmetry. As I said, this X3 will slightly mix with the Z prime, which means that in addition to the dark photon, we get another one, which is slightly mixed with this uh, theta prime that you can call dark weinberg angle. in the sense that if you take the standard model, X1 and X2 will be like the W boson, and X3 will be like the Z boson. So this is why we call it dark, dark weinberg angle. All right, so with this new dark matter candidates, let's see what we can do. 
So as I said, um, the mass splitting between this new X3 particle and X is essentially um, fixed by the representation of the X. And we can play the same game and compute the rate density, taking into account forbidden channel with this new X3 in the game, and also the one uh, from the C regime. And what we get is that uh, there is a part, delta equal uh, 0 0.7, under which forbidden channel regime will become dominant, and over which simp regime will be dominant. And as I said, this mass splitting is determined by the representation i of the new scalar, which means, depending on the representation, I will be typically in the forbidden channel regime or in the simp regime. And what is important, uh, as I told you before, if we are in the forbidden channel regime, we need a much lighter gauge coupling, and we cannot have a large self-interaction cross-section. So, but if we are in the SIP regime, we can. So essentially, this tells us that we need essentially the representation of the, of the scalar which breaks the SU2 symmetry to be something like i equal 3 divided by 2, which makes uh, the, the scalar a 4-plet and the SU2. But it also works with a 5, 6, etc., etc. So in, in all this, the scalars are typically uh, higher masses than dark matter mass, and they don't actually uh, contribute to the rate density. So I think it's, it is, it, it's interesting actually to see properties of the dark matter that we could actually observe in galactic structure and to relate it directly with the, the um, fundamental symmetry property of the theory. So by this factor, I, I think that's, uh, that's actually quite nice. So in this case, I can draw the same plot that before with the gauge coupling as a function of the dark matter mass. And we can see if we can have correct rate density and uh, have a large uh, self interaction cross-section. And you see that uh, we can we can achieve the rate density and have a cross section between self interaction cross section between one and point one for a much more reasonable value of the gauge coupling, which will allow uh, to be essentially more compatible uh, with these this bounds on the self interaction cross section than the, from the galaxy clusters. Uh, just to show you what are the typical constraints in this case. So in this case, the parameter space is much actually larger because the X3 particle allows us to actually achieve thermalization much more efficiently than before. And we can write down the kinetic mixing as a function of the C prime mass in this case. And all these color parts are essentially constraints. And same thing here, uh, when the, the kinetic mixing is too small, I cannot satisfy the kinetic equilibrium condition. What I wanted to show you in this plot essentially is this, the, this, this lines. So in this case, we have a dark matter candidate which have a mass of the order of 100 MeV that actually couples electrons, which means that we can have an efficient direct detection cross-section scattering between dark matter and electrons. I think it's quite important because there have been uh, a lot of proposals actually to develop essentially this, uh, this part of the parameter space since the traditional the dark matter direct detection experiment already cover essentially so, but particle mass with, um, sorry, larger than the GB scale. But here, we, with this kind of experiment, we might be able to probe dark matter candidates below uh, the GB scale. And essentially, so I just show you this line, but for each value of the epsilon, you get essentially a cross-section which is typically larger than this value. But this could be a potential way of uh, probing the model. And I think this, this is going to develop a lot in the next future. So that will give uh, essentially a nice uh, additional signature of the model. All right, so uh, I think I said uh, I said everything. So I hope you are still uh, awake. <laughs> and uh, well, essentially what I wanted to tell you in this work is uh, this approach of trying to, to, to picture physics beyond the standard model and the cosmological model from a sort of unified point of view and try to find scenarios that could have signatures on both, both sides. So I hope I successfully described it in the context of the Hubble and G minus two tension, and that I convince you that this model with the leptophilic gauge boson is actually motivating. And as I said, if you like it, the good thing is you will be able to tell me in a few years the entire model is ruled out, and that I'm fine with that. And in the second part, so I showed that uh, we are able to provide a dark matter candidate in the, the same mechanism and to have a dark matter candidate which have a large self-interaction cross-section that would also lead to a very specific signature of the model. So uh, to conclude, I think there is a very rich interplay between cosmology and uh, beyond the sound of physics and I think we should, uh, we should try to focus more on that. <laughs>
Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Matthias. So we are now open for questions. Remember to unmute yourself. So just a comment, Matthias. If you want, if you believe in both problems, then you need an extra SU two cross U one cross U one. No? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, maybe you can you can find something that works for both of them. But yeah, sure. Yeah, that's. Uh, well, I'm not saying that it's unlikely, but uh, it would be surprising. But anyway, I mean, the standard model gauge group is SU two cross SU SU three cross U one. It's not. So different at the end. But the scales of both solutions are different, no? Uh, different, but not too far, essentially. So typically sub MEV for the mu minus star and uh, sub GV for the, for the dark matter model. More questions? No more questions? Okay. So uh, I would like to thank Matthias for uh, his effort. I'm, I'm going to clap here in the name of everybody. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so uh, thank you, Matthias. Uh, so the, the construction workers uh, respected the seminar. So. Yeah. We have the noise. <laughs> and uh, uh, remember that uh, you can you can probably get uh, maybe tomorrow this uh, recording in the YouTube channel of the AFT. So thank you very much for coming in and uh, uh, have a nice weekend. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. So I went uh, okay. Huh? Thank you very much for the talk. Very nice. Thank you. And uh, okay. So see you around uh, maybe <laughs> a few weeks. <laughs> yeah. All the best for you. See you. Yeah. See you. <laughs>